Hey everyone, I've been collecting parts over the last two or three years to build a ruby laser and finally in the last week or so I've got all the major components here uh, so that I can start uh, making an honest effort. Lasers are basically light amplifiers and in this case this is a helium neon laser and we've got mirrors on either end and a mix of helium neon gas in the middle. So the, uh, when we apply power to this, the helium neon gas emits light, just like it does in a plain old neon sign. But the trick is that the mirrors on either end uh, constrain this optical cavity to be uh, working in one direction, since the mirrors are facing each other. The key is that the laser medium uh, provides this light amplification with a directional component. So if we do the mirror trick and, and align up these mirrors very carefully, we get a very thin directional beam of light out of it. The same thing is true of ruby. So this is a ruby rod that's synthetic, and I got this is I got this one off of eBay, and it's in pretty good condition. There's a nick on one end here that's sort of noticeable, but otherwise it's okay. And this one is relatively large. Ruby is just aluminum oxide that's been doped with a little bit of chromium, and for synthetic ruby like this, we can actually control the chromium content to alter its laser properties. So unlike a helium neon laser where we can just put electricity across it and have the helium neon emit its own light just through plasma excitation, with a ruby laser we have to provide the light from somewhere else, or we have to excite the, the uh, atoms in here some other way. And typically this is done with a large xenon flash tube. The idea is that when the flash tube fires, the chromium ions in this ruby rod will become excited, just like the helium neon atoms become excited in the laser over here just from the uh, light emitted by the, the plasma. One major difference though is the density of the laser medium. So in here it's just a gas, helium neon, it's not even at atmospheric pressure, whereas here we're talking about a solid. So we actually need quite a bit more light per volume of, of laser medium because it's just so much more dense. And this leads us to very large and powerful flash tubes, which is what I'm going to talk about in this video. So as you can see, I've been collecting quite a few large flash tubes. This one is uh, quite intimidating. Um, the problem is that it's so much larger than the ruby rod, there's no easy way to get all of the light from this flash tube into the ruby. The idea is that we want this flash tube to go off, and then all of the light will go into the ruby rod and excite it, so that it can start lasing. One way to achieve this is to use a helical flash tube like this. This is from a professional photographer's setup, but as you can see again, the flash is not quite enough to cover the whole tube. What we really want is something that will get light into the entire tube. One of the tricks with Ruby is that if you don't excite the entire tube with flashlight, uh, the rod itself will absorb its own laser light and then it will stop lasing, so the entire tube needs to be completely saturated with flashlight. One possible way to do this is to get a straight flash tube and put it near the ruby rod and then put this in an elliptical enclosure and an ellipse has two foci inside and if the rod is on one foci and the flash tube is on the other then you polish the inside of this whole elliptical chamber will get good coupling between the flash tube and the rod. Um, and this can be extended, you could have like a double elliptical chamber or, or as many tubes as you want around it basically. But again, this particular flash lamp was just a little too long and so I'd be losing a good, you know, 20 or 30 percent of the flash length uh, trying to get all the light into the rod. And also this single flash tube wasn't enough and so I'd need at least two of these and even then it probably wasn't quite enough. So luckily I recently found a pair of these on eBay and this is a helical flash tube that is almost the perfect length uh, for, this, for this ruby rod here. And it's a little bit too short, but I think that's going to be okay. So if my chamber is reflective on the inside, uh, we'll get good coverage of, of flashlight into the, into the rod. I've also got specialized mirrors that are made specifically for ruby lasers, and they are in these gimbal mounts. And so if I turn the knobs on these mirror mounts, it's adjusting the alignment of the mirror in a very, very fine manner. And the trick is that we align this whole system with another laser. In this case, I've got a, a helium neon uh, facing into it like this. And the idea is that we put a card here with a hole in the card and then adjust the knobs around so that the beam goes straight in 
and then straight back out and disappears on the card because it's actually going back into the laser. And once, you, once the mirrors are aligned properly like that, we know that we have an optical resonator, a cavity here, where the light is just going to go back and forth between the two mirrors. Now the trick is that the forward mirror is only partially reflecting, and for a ruby laser, uh, the gain is fairly high, again, because the rod is so dense. So for a helium-neon laser, the gas molecules don't provide all that much light amplification, so the mirrors are both very reflective. The output mirror is probably 98% reflective, so the light that comes out of a helium-neon laser is only about 2% of what's being bounced around inside the cavity. For a ruby laser, this is only about 30% reflective, so most of the light is actually leaving the cavity for each bounce. So the idea is we'd put the ruby rod inside the flash tube and support it with something. This is not my, my final design, this is just a test bed. And then you basically want to construct an aluminum or a metal chamber around the whole flash tube like this to keep the light inside so that all the light generated by the flash system will be reflected around and go into the ruby rod. The electrical system is surprisingly simple. It's basically just a high voltage supply that's connected to a capacitor bank, and then the capacitors are wired right across the flash lamp, sort of at all times. And then when we want to make a flash happen, we trigger the flash lamp with this trigger circuit. So there isn't really any switching device. You don't really need a thyristor or anything like that. The major design trick is to figure out how to operate the flash lamp in a safe way and also get as much light out as possible into the ruby rod. So one of the tricks with ruby is that we only have about a two or three millisecond window to pump light into it before it will start to self-emit. So with, with laser mediums there's this um, residence time where the uh, gain medium will stay activated before it starts to decay all by itself. And for ruby I think this is about two or three milliseconds, which is good because that means we have actually a relatively long amount of time to pump it up with the light from the xenon flash. This system of triggering is called external triggering. And what happens is if we put a metal uh, or a conductive substance around the outside of the tube and then suddenly hit it with a really fast uh, pulse of high voltage, the electricity will actually capacitively couple through the quartz wall of the tube and ionize the gas inside, which is what breaks it down and allows the arc to strike or allows the main capacitor bank to discharge. There's other ways to initiate the breakdown too. We could put a coil or a transformer in this supply line and then inject the high voltage pulse into the supply line here, and this is known as series triggering. So there's a couple, I'll put a link in the description to this PDF, but there's a couple different ways of setting up triggering. For now, I think I'm gonna to try to stay with external triggering. Since I don't, I'm not gonna have a high refresh or a high repetition rate of flashes, I'm gonna to try to air cool this tube. And um, it, when we do air cooling, that's, that makes the job a lot easier for obviously a lot of reasons. One thing to watch out for is the maximum amount of energy that the flash tube can take in one shot. This is known as the explosion energy. And it's the lifetime of the tube is related to the percentage at which you run the explosion energy. So obviously if you ran it at 100%, it's going to explode and your lifetime would be one flash. Uh, you also don't really want to operate it at 60% of its explosion energy because you have a very short life, probably you know 100 flashes or something like that. So this chart here helps us calculate what the explosion energy would be for that tube. And we look up the bore diameter, which in this case is about 8 millimeters, and the pulse duration, one-third of peak amplitude in milliseconds. So let's say our pulse is going to last one and a half or maybe two milliseconds. We can uh, look that up on the chart and then look over and it will tell us how much energy we can have per length of flash tube. So this comes out to be you know somewhere on the order of one kilojoule per inch of flash tube and since this is a helical flash tube we get to figure out how long it is just by um, you know calculating the circumference and multiplying by the number of turns and as it all comes out we end up with about a 30 kilojoule burst energy or explosion energy and uh, ideally I want to run this tube at about 8 kilojoule pulses and so if we use another equation to figure out what the lifetime would be we end up with about 76,000 flashes so we'll be pretty safe uh, operating it at 8 kilojoules. 
as it happens, I found this documentation sheet uh, in a Perkins Elmer catalog and found a tube that's very, very similar, but not exactly the same as mine. And they list the explosion energy uh, for a half millisecond pulse at about 20 point something kilojoules there. So it's in the same ballpark. To test out the actual pulse length, I've made this little optical sensor circuit. And what I did was I took apart a fast photodiode from one of these little fiber optic connectors, and I'll, I'll put a link in the description, and reverse biased it with this 9-volt battery. And this is a thin piece of coax that's going off to the scope. So what I do when I'm running a, a test shot is just to put this little sensor kind of anywhere near the flash tube, and then the scope will record the amount of light hitting uh, the sensor. The capacitor bank can be configured in a lot of different ways. So for example, we could keep putting more and more capacitors in series to get a higher voltage, or we could put more of them in parallel to get a higher capacitance. And the uh, decision, I mean, the way that we make that decision is to figure out uh, what sort of pulse length we get for a given voltage. And this, this depends upon the tube's impedance and the inductance, if we add any to this and uh, the re internal resistance of the capacitors. It's basically quite an involved thing. And so I'll probably do some uh, testing as I go along. Currently, this is only about a tenth of my total bank capacitance. This is maybe uh, 600 joules of energy storage here. And the rest of the bank includes way more of these capacitors to bring it up to a total of about six and a half kilojoules. And then I have another 4.8 kilojoules of caps that I haven't taken out of this professional photography unit. I'm using this electrophoresis power supply to charge up the cap bank, and this is pretty convenient because it will do 6 kilovolts at 100 milliamps, which is a, a lot of power and voltage, and it can also be limited in charge power in watts, so I can set a limit of, say, 20 watts, and it won't charge any faster than that, which is, um, you know, nice just to sort of keep an eye on things. Things won't charge too quickly. To discharge the bank, I've got this really large thick film resistor, I tried using some wire wound resistors, but even despite having power ratings of like 25 watts or something, they would just pop instantly because the peak power is so high. With this one, I generally connect a grounding wire to one side of this and then draw an arc off the capacitor bank here. So I've started the supply here and you can see it's charging up and uh, it's peaking out or it's, it's limiting at about 14 watts of charge and the voltage is going to come up to about 3,000. So this, this supply is super handy because I can set a voltage limit and also um, a, a power limit. So now as we approach 3,000 volts, the limit transitions to voltage, and it will maintain this 3,000 volt charge in the bank. So if I were going to discharge it, I'm going to connect the ground lead to the other side of this resistor here, and then I'm going to turn the supply off, which doesn't actually discharge the bank internally. All it does is disconnect. So to discharge it, we actually draw an arc here. And you can see the voltage is coming down quite a bit. The data sheet that I found says that a tube of this length has a minimum firing voltage of about 4,000 volts. And so I've been trying other tubes out, and I've got this one to fire sort of irregularly at about 3,000 volts but haven't had uh, the guts to get a large enough capacitive bank to do 4,000 yet, um, but I will soon. I would show you this thing flashing, but on camera it's not that exciting because all you see is a single white frame. You can see another video that I posted where I was showing what a 4.8 kilojoule uh, flash looks like, and it, it's just actually not that exciting on video. Also, these tubes are quartz glass. They are not uh, soda lime glass and that means that they pass ultraviolet light just fine uh, and there's quite a bit of ultraviolet emitted in the xenon arc. So you have to be careful with these because they actually will uh, give you a UV dose if you don't uh, wear eye protection. So I have these which are um, laser safety glasses but I'm not sure if these actually block UV so it would really be better just build this into an enclosure so that none of the um, xenon arc lamp light gets out. Uh, just the laser light, which will be blocked by these. Okay, see you next time. Bye.